researcher who works with micro and nanotechnologies. You may be wondering, well, what in the world is that? A good example of what I do can be found in your pocket. Take the innovation of the phone. 60 years ago, the phone was attached to the wall. Then it was attached to the car. Then it became handheld, and now it's getting smaller and smaller. You see, large bulky devices are costly in terms of inconvenience, and our devices will continue to shrink until we are literally interacting with thin air. After all, storage, memory, and many applications are already in the cloud. For now, most of the core and computational components that make up your typical electronic device have been miniaturized, and this is the field that I'm in. But it's not all that I do. I'd like to share three applications of how my colleagues and I utilize micro and nanotechnology to make life and living and the world around us better. But before I jump into those three specific applications, welcome to my course on micro and nanotechnology 101, where I present to you measures to show you just how small we're talking. Those measures are scale, quantity, and surface area. Now, let's begin with scale. When I say micro in reference to length, what I'm saying is a micrometer is a millionth of a meter. Just how small is that? Well, think bacteria or skin cells. Now take a micrometer and make it a thousand times smaller. That's a nanometer, a billionth of a meter. And just how small is that? Think the size of DNA. Now, skin cells and the strand of DNA are minuscule in size, even unseen, but that doesn't take away from their functionality. They're small but major, tiny yet significant. Now, scale is not the only consideration in this line of work. Let's look at quantity. And a good example of quantity is how nature relies on the quantity of trees to power and sustain life on the planet. Through photosynthesis, one single tree is capable of converting 28 watt hours of energy per day. That's equivalent to three LED light bulbs. Now, you may be thinking, that's not a lot. So let's look at a larger quantity. Let's take 28 watt hours and multiply it by three trillion, or the number of trees on the planet. There's power in numbers, in this case, more like 84 trillion watts of power. If you were able to actually see the energy being used by the trees, the Earth would shine like the sun at sunset. Now, for the last measure, surface area, I want you to grasp this one, and I think in order to do that, let's do a small little exercise. Let's take one square meter and divide it into smaller squares. Then for every other square, raise it up or down. We've just increased the surface area without taking up any more lateral space. If we did this on the micrometer scale, the increase in surface area is about 15,000 times more. And if done on the nanometer scale, the increase is about 60,000 times more. Now for the applications. My colleagues, took these measures into account to develop a more effective solar cell. And by solar cell, you may think solar panel. And when you think solar panel, this may come to mind. Now, this technology does exactly what it's supposed to, but there are some limitations when it comes to the everyday consumer. For one, they take up a lot of space. And for two, let's be honest, they don't look exactly attractive to slap on top of your roof. <laughs> So our idea is to take this to this, and this to a series of these. Using micro and nanotechnology fabrication techniques, including what is widely known as photolithography and additive manufacturing, because by increasing the surface area of the panel, we can increase the quantity of solar cells within the same area. Think back to the tree example I shared earlier. With one tree, you only have so many leaves, and so only so much photosynthesis can happen. 
But by increasing the surface area, say, of a square inch, the number of trees or panels becomes 4 million, and the number of leaves or solar cells is over a trillion. This puts more power not in the palm of your hand, but at your fingertips. Now, the second application originated at the Center for Advanced Microstructures and Devices at Louisiana State University. This is a synchrotron radiation facility, one of 16 in the nation and one of 70 worldwide. Essentially, the center houses a giant ring light within a steel tube under an extreme vacuum. Electrons are pumped into the tube, and they travel and accelerate it up to nearly the speed of light, around and around. Now, ordinarily, uh, electrons and particles alike travel in a straight path. So in order to force them to go around, we use large electromagnets. And when they take the curve, they emit synchrotron radiation, what we use to manufacture things on the micro scale. So what type of things? Have you ever been sitting on the couch, binging Netflix with your computer on your lap? And has that computer ever gotten super hot? <laughs> what you're feeling is the heat sink, a device designed to channel heat away from the computer processor. And depending, this object is large, making your laptop big and bulky. I created a heat sink on the micro scale. Obviously much smaller, so small in fact, they were able to seamlessly integrate it onto the chips causing the heat. This drastic difference in size not only keeps our computers cooler, but reduces the size and the weight without compromising functionality. Now, this couldn't have been accomplished without using nanoparticles, and that brings me to the third application I'd like to share with you. Starting my tenure at Southern University, I discovered the world of composite materials, materials that are engineered and tailored to fit specific applications. We would take ordinary materials like metal, plastic, and ceramic, and add micro and nanoparticles to these materials to make these ordinary materials extraordinary. And just like programming a computer, we can program these materials to behave in a certain way. We can even program them to self-repair under certain environmental and operational conditions. This particular syntactic foam was 3D printed to serve as a structural enhancement that's sturdy enough to stand on, yet light as a feather. You can look at these as examples, small examples of building blocks or bricks of a building. What makes them extraordinary is not only can they self-repair and shapeshift, they also exhibit a degree of flame retardancy. Can you imagine utilizing these self-repairing composite materials in the field of home construction? What would it mean in South Louisiana to 3D print your home capable of withstanding hurricane force winds or self-repairing if damaged? or even being flame retardant? What would it mean to an everyday citizen whose homeowner's insurance has finally lowered because their home is constructed of these extraordinary materials? <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So what's next for our research team? Lots. We have patents pending on some cool technology I hope to share with you soon. One aspect of our work that we're truly passionate about is bringing awareness to this type of technology occurring right here in our hometown of Baton Rouge. And to bring awareness, we're doing more outreach and education services, especially to our youth in under-resourced communities. If you didn't know about micro and nanotechnology before, I hope you now have a greater appreciation for what these scales can mean to our lives. They can and have already transformed industries. They've transformed the way we power the world. They've transformed our infrastructure, and they've made our world stronger and more efficient. Because when you work on the micro and nano scales, you make the ordinary extraordinary. Thank you. <laughs>